Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the chance to read and to study and to discuss. And we pray, Lord, that you would be with us as we talk about it, and give us wisdom. So hear our prayer now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so we've already sort of gotten into it. And for those who maybe haven't been here on past weeks, we're in the third letter of John, and it's John the Elder writing to who? David. Use that marker. My other one. speculating who might Gaius be? A host for the traveling creatures. What's that? A host for the traveling creatures. Okay, as we talked about before, the church, you don't have a building with a lot of people. Churches are meeting in homes. Gaius may very well be one of the people who has these homes and the church is meeting in his home and he's probably you know, a wealthier person, and he's got some status, and so, and he's writing to, he's, John is applauding him for supporting these traveling preachers who are coming and staying in the homes and helping the churches out, and so you've got this level, and, and also for supporting him, and that's the first little part of the letter. And then if we flip over to the other, the next page, verse 9, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, so here's another question. Who's Diotrephes? Now, Diotrephes could be, we don't know, could be similar to Gaius in that <laughs> another one of these churches might meet in his home. Are you okay, Lois? Oh, yeah, I'd say I feel the color wrong. Okay. <laughs> that way I don't breathe up in my hair. So, Diotrephes might be basically in another church. And he's obviously exerting some control. And John says, tells us a little bit about him, who loves to be first. Um, who loves to be the first among them, but does not acknowledge us. Now here's a question. Who's us? The people who attend the other believers. Could be the other believers. He certainly, John is including himself, obviously, in us. Was it the traveling plural? He just uses the word plural. Or the traveling preachers. Could be John and the traveling preachers. It's quite likely that you know, just like Jesus had disciples, John had disciples, some of whom would go with him. So it's not exactly clear who us is. So when I come, I will call attention to what, um, what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Okay, so what is Diotrephes doing? Right, right. Or else I wouldn't use us. I'd be saying, he don't believe in Barbara, Dom, Dick, Harry, Black. I'd be naming the group. Yeah, that's true. So for me, you know, when I was young and I tried to read the Bible, I put so much assumptions on it in my head that yep. it just didn't ring true. Yep. Now when I read the Bible, I kind of not go past the word that's written and say, okay, 20,000 years ago, I was not reading this. What does that look like? And yeah. that looks very simple to me. Yeah. Don't look like all that 
So this would act us, Mike, me, and the other folks. It could be it could be John and Gaius. So it's you're right, it's not clear, we don't know, but there's obviously conflict in the church and there's tension. And so but he's disparaging us with evil words. The if you go down the if you go across the translations, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Uh, he is doing. Um, when I come, I will report some of the things he is doing and evil accusations he is making against us. Lewis, you gonna you gonna? It's gonna be hard for more to pay attention to the class. Well, I might get to some present day news, not just the old news. Now, yeah, I understand, but in the, in the class we kind of have a way of working, and so, yeah. so if you, so you okay. Paul, when you finish that verse, not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. So right. Sounds like more than one in the group. Right, and and again, it could be because Gaius. John is writing to Gaius about these traveling preachers and him welcoming them into his home. It could be that what Diotrephes is doing is he doesn't want to welcome the traveling preachers into his home. Why? We They're don't know. not spreading the word as he sees it. Okay. He's, he's a self-centered, it's my way or the highway. Okay. So he wants to basically control his little group and doesn't want anybody else messing with it. And going beyond that, because he's also trying to stop those who are welcoming them. That's right. So he not only wants, is not letting the traveling preachers into his place, but he wants Gaius to stop. And, and this, in fact, could be John's motivation for writing the letter completely. Because John is, now here's, here's you know, if you remember back in the book of Corinthians, there's probably lots of communication going on. And so there's rumors that this stuff is going on. And so word has been getting to John. So John writes to Gaius about the atrophies about, because it could be that Gaius was, had been helping these traveling teachers. And now he's been getting criticism and complaints and pressure. And John wants to offset that pressure. And John is leveraging his status towards this end. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does not, the one who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Next, dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does who does what is good is from God, and anyone who does what is evil is, um, has not seen God. In verse 11 in the NLT. Dear friend, don't let this bad example influence you. You can notice very much the difference with a paraphrase. Follow only what is good. Remember those who do good, prove that they are God's children, and those who do evil, prove that they do not know God. Now take a look at the different ways verse 11 is treated by the three versions. What do you notice? <laughs> The latter, the last one, I think, is much more severe. Okay, what do you mean by that, Marty? Well, remember, those who do good prove that they are God's children, and those who do evil prove that they do not know God. Yeah. And also that um, he doesn't want uh, this guy to influence him. Yeah, yeah. Anything, anything strike you interesting about any of those three translations? No, evil does not know God. Now, now look at look at the end of the translation. You have that what is evil has not seen God, that they do not know God. Now, e pretty easily in our minds, we can translate see to know. But C is kind of an interesting word, and it's to me it's just an interesting it's just an interesting way to go about this. He gives a pretty blanket statement 
The one who does good is of God. The one who does not, the one who does evil has not seen God. And you know, I can have a, um, that's interesting because I think people know God do do evil. Hopefully not. Well, and, and, yeah, I mean, this is, in many ways we see this, we say, wow, that's a pretty blanket statement. And I think that's kind of what Marty reacted to is it's a pretty blanket statement. And, and we've seen this. Remember, we started with 2 John and then 3 John, and then we're going to go to 1 John. But what we've seen in these letters is John is given to hyperbole. <laughs> he likes big blanket statements. And it's helpful to know an author's habits like that because it helps you Yes. Go ahead, Marty. The Greek, does it say anything different? Any, any other emphasis? <laughs> this, first, this first column is a very literalistic translation okay. of the Greek. And so if, if you want to kind of get a rendering of Greek word for word in English, that first translation does it quite well. Okay. And see, then with each successive column, it attempts to the editors are trying to make it a little bit more intelligible to us. But part of this gets into, um, so, I, so I have two sisters. I have an older sister and a younger sister. And my younger sister is temperamentally very much like my mother, very even keeled, very measured, doesn't like to take trips, likes, to, likes, likes her routine. My older sister is very dramatic. She's an artist. Um, so growing up, my, the, my mother and my older sister is quite a bit of, I wouldn't say conflict, but so, so if, if, my older, if my older sister would come home from school and she had a bad day, this is my worst day ever. <laughs> Everything is terrible. And my mother would hear this and, and, and in a sense take her literally. Because if my mother would say something like that, it was a really bad day. But when my sister would say it, well, she had a bad day. And so then my father would do translating for my mother and say, oh, honey, you know that this is how she talks. And, and so it's helpful with these authors, when you read them, to understand this is how John talks. The difficulty that you have, that we have is sometimes we take a phrase like this out of a book like this and then we try to map it onto other things. And so we find, just like you said, I mean, um, Barbara, when you, when you said what you said there, what you added was nuance, which is, well, Christian people sometimes do bad things. If you take this statement, just kind of lift it from the text and say, those who do good are people of God and those who do evil have not seen God. You can, you can twist do a lot gospel. of mess, what's that? It really twists the gospel. Well, yeah, you can, you can make a big mess with a phrase like that. Yeah, you should see my mess last night. You <laughs> I mean, it would break down headstones and pyramids. So scanning over it, see if I can, you know, pull them out of the water. I got a few of them, a few of them didn't drown. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's helpful, but yet, in the stark phrase, you understand, so what's he mean by such a stark phrase? Because, in a sense, we do want to kind of interpret it, so we don't, we don't go crazy with it. That these people, this guy in Diotrephes is really doesn't understand who God is in God's way. That, that is what John is saying. Now, that, that, that's essentially what he's saying, is that Diotrephes is trying to control the church, and he doesn't understand the bigger picture of what God is doing. But John phrases it in a very dramatic way. And so when you read it, you know, you've got to be careful with hyperbole. Jesus uses hyperbole. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Now, if we took that phrase very literally, 
we would all be the honey and all be walking around. We wouldn't have any hands left because we'd go through the right and then, you know, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. We have some sleep or change your breath that we know how to do. Well, very few actually practice it very literally, but um, it's, oh, that's right. It's, this is, this is difficult stuff, but, but to understand, it's important to try to understand the language and, and where John is going with this. And it's also interesting, has not seen God. Now, that too can be taken a lot of different ways. How might John mean, what might John, what might John mean by seeing God? I see what happened. Understanding him. Okay. See, and that's where you see the NLT, when they translate see to know, well, that kind of takes the rough edge off for us. But here's the thing. Right now, you know, I'm in a lot of conversations with people who will say, you have to experience God. Okay, so then I'll pause them and say, well, what do you mean by that? Because there's an idea behind this too. And it's usually, it might be a mystical experience. And so there are people who will tell you, unless you have this mystical experience, you, you, don't, know God. you don't know God. <laughs> and so people will listen, people will read this, and just like Barbara said in their mind, they fill in, okay, what does he mean by that? Well, well, let's go back a little bit and see, this is why we're taking the books in the order we are. You've got 2 John, 3 John, 1 John, and then we're going to go to the Gospel of John. And if you read the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John keeps talking about, well, how might John imagine he's seen God? Verse 27. Because he's seen Jesus. Verse 21, quote, Jesus once more, Jesus said to them, I'm going away. You will not look for me, and you will die for your sin where I go, you cannot come. Yeah, you're reading in you're reading in the Gospel of John. So, but but here in the, the Epistle of John here, it's he could John could very much he's not seen he's not seen Jesus. Well, who has seen Jesus? John. John. That's the basis for his authority. So, you know, there, there's a if you if you pause and you look at the text and and you just stop and say, well, what does this mean? And you start asking some follow-up questions, it can be productive. Does okay. he, you think he means actually has not seen God with his eyes? Well, that's just it. Physical. Yes. Seeing. Yes. But this is where we get into the mystical interpretation. Because people will come and say, well, you don't know, but I've seen. Okay, well, what do you mean that you've seen? Well, I had this experience. And, and then it leads into all kinds of conversations about, well, what's our better mode of being? Because it's a uh, uh, better mode of knowing. Well, I've had an experience. Okay. Um, Louis last night was having an experience with pyramids and tombstones, right? Yeah. Which can the underwater areas still got remaining. Right. And that was very, and that's what you were, that's what you experienced last night, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, scan to get there, scan to get back. Okay. It's no same place. And it's right here in our country. And who's going to deny Louis' experience? Can't yeah. deny his experience. I so, hope so. It looks like another Godzilla movie. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. But lots of people have experiences. So on one end, we have experiences. On the other hand, we have other frames of reference that we use in conjunction with this to try to figure things out. Okay, verse 12. Demetrius has been testified to by all, even by the truth itself, and we testify to him, and you know that our testimony is true. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone. Now notice, again, the change in translations. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone, and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, 
and you know that our testimony is true. Everyone speaks highly of Demetrius, as does the truth itself. We ourselves can say the same for him, and you know we speak the truth. All right. What do you see in those three translations? That's right. What do you think he's talking about? Who might this Demetrius be? Another one of the hosts to the teachers, the traveling teachers. Maybe. Well, think about, okay, so think about the context of this again. He could be one of the teachers. He could be, he could be one of the teachers. This could be Demetrius here. Because John is saying good things about him to Gaius. And we know that at the beginning of the book, he's emphasizing Gaius' support for the traveling teachers. So Demetrius could very well be one of these teachers. Because John is now using this verse to, to support him and to encourage them to pay attention to him. And anything else that's interesting here? The truth comes back in. Okay, the truth comes back in. Now, all three of these translations preserve what is a rather cryptic way of speaking English, which is interesting. So Demetrius has been testified to by all. Now again, remember John's pattern of speech. John likes hyperbole. And Spanish has this phrase, todo el mundo, which means the whole world. And if you're speaking Spanish and you want to say, todo el mundo sabe, the whole world knows blank. Now what is that? The whole world knows that it takes two to tango. It takes two to tango. <laughs> the whole world knows that it takes two to tango. Well, how, what is that phrase? Hyperbole. It's hyperbole. Does everyone in the world know that? No. 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 So there's a literalism that obviously warps the, the, this use of language. Well, Demetrius has been testified to by all. Obviously not by Diotrephes. <laughs> so not by all. Um, the NIV kind of takes the edge off. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone. It's kind of the same thing. Everyone speaks highly of Demetrius. I don't know why the NLT wants to change the word order, but there they did. Um, even by the truth itself. But notice, even by the truth itself as does the truth itself. All three translations preserve that phrase. Why? And what does that phrase mean? That is the most important part of the statement, isn't it? But what does that phrase mean? By the word of God. By the word of God. What, do you, what, is, what does Marty's phrase mean? The truth of the gospel. The truth in the gospel. So it could mean that the things that Demetrius says correlate to <clears throat> truth in the gospel. What does that mean? Well, I just read it as, well, when I read it when I was much younger, it identified a group to me. Okay. So, Every time it referred to the group, I kind of looked at what Paul was saying, this is the group of truth, and this is the truth that we speak. And I always questioned, that's what had me question the Bible in the first place, was the truth. <laughs> or what is the truth? Yeah, who wrote the truth? <laughs> like historians. Well, and, and, and this gets, this very much gets into the trickiness of this idea we have of truth. Now, I don't want to encourage skepticism, but I want to encourage 
clarity what we're talking about here. Now the word itself and his use of it may be ambiguous, but one option is that the gospel contains this thing called truth. What is this thing called truth? Well, is it something that corresponds? Yeah, there's certainly a correspondence nature to it. But another, but what's so interesting about this phrase is, and, okay, Demetrius has been testified to by all, and notice how testified gets spoken. That's kind of a testify, it's a spoken thing. And even by the truth itself. So the truth is speaking. It's personified. So what's another candidate for what he means here? Who's testifying to Demetrius? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Or the Holy Spirit. See, it's very interesting how, you know, language is amazing, how this can be used many ways and Often, depending on our cultural filters, we bias towards one aspect of thinking about it. Now, I think, let's put Jesus here. And, and I think all of these are valid. It can be understood in all of these ways. It's hard to figure out what the author had in mind. I would, I would tend to think he says Jesus. But then we kind of go back and say, but... But how do you know, John? And well, the Spirit testifies to me. Well, how does that work, John? And I mean, we can't answer these questions. But in a sense, again, what John is saying is, John, Gaius, everyone in the world, and Jesus all testify that Demetrius is a faithful teacher is a spirit, I mean, with which Christian tribe, the language of which Christian tribe do you want to use, is an anointed leader. I mean, and, and when you look at the Christian tribes, you can see that each of them has this language that tends to go along with them. And, and they mean similar things, they mean correspondent things, but they all have their own nuances. And so basically John is saying, John wants Demetrius to be in these houses teaching because he with Demetrius, Demetrius might even be a disciple of John because John's probably getting old, can't travel as much, and so you've got, and again, this is part of the reason you've got age here and status, Demetrius is doing all the legwork. And Demetrius is going from house to house to house to house because they've got a difficulty here because as as more and more people become Christians, well, you've got, you got to fit them into these houses. Well, and now you begin to understand why the church has taken the form it has. Once later on, after Constantine and Christianity is recognized, what do they start doing? Splitting. Not splitting. Unifying. You know, Unifying. Meeting in groups, but then many groups. Not I, I splitting, well, I mean, by many churches. Well, that's right. Well, you've always, you know, the, the differences and the tensions you have at this level, well, they'll just get to a bigger level because let's say Demetrius is a really good teacher and he's over being at Gaius's house. And then some of the people in the other, they get tired of listening to Diotrephes talk and he's a control freak, and he's just he really always harps on about this one thing. So they start sneaking over here. So then later on, after all these people are dead, well, everybody likes listening to Demetrius. Well, then you start, well, let's, instead of meeting at homes, let's do what? Let's pool our money and build a building. And, and you can see how the development of what we recognize as church happened. And, and, but, but that isn't available to them now, so John is trying to manage this, and he's saying, well, you know, support Demetrius, and when I come, I'm going to have a word with Theotrephes, because 
is not doing right. And well, what's what's John's agenda? Get the truth out. He wants unity to do that. He wants visions. That's right. So we got to talk through all this stuff. And and again, it's very interesting because here in this letter, there's no big. There's no big doctrinal point that is made about that, that is made in this letter. This we are really looking over. We are really reading someone else's mail in this letter. <laughs> this is not the book of Romans where Paul is going to do this sweeping teaching. But it's interesting how from very early on the church said, "We want this letter in our collection." And now this letter is there are certain places in the Bible that everyone clumps to because we all want to read the 23rd Psalm and we all want to read the Lord's Prayer and we all want to read the Sermons on the Mount. But then there's, there's backwaters. This is a backwater. Part of the reason it's a backwater is if you read the letter, you think, I have no idea what this is about. I didn't even know why it's in the Bible. Most people don't even think that. They're like they've got their Bible reading plan and so they look at the schedule. Okay, today I've got to read 3rd John. Okay, I'm going to read 3rd John. Okay, got that done. Check. On to the next one. And, and the thing is, it's hard to figure out if, if someone would... So, so if you slide into the room, they, they check and say, okay, stop. What did you just read? I don't know. 3rd John. I read 3rd John. Okay, what's the book about? I don't know. The truth. <laughs> the, the, the truth. I got the truth. There's a John, and there's a Gaius, and there's a Diotrephes, and there's a Demetrius, but I got to read. Um, I'm, I'm on to the book of Revelation. Okay, stop. Slow down. Why you say another attempt? Another attempt at what? I didn't say it once. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll just see God. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I, I believe I believe you're deadly serious. Yeah. <laughs> good friend. So, but but here we begin to see. Well, have you ever wondered what life was like in the early church? Yes, many discussions. Yeah. Here's a snapshot, but it's not going to yield insight quickly. We're going to have to walk through it, talk about the relationships, and again. You know, the New Living Translation, which is a paraphrase, they try to fill in the gaps. They say, oh, I want a word, I want a translation of the Bible that, that's just the Bible. Oh, okay. You're going to have to do a little bit more work to try to figure out what this is. Because, well, and here's the thing. This is an early, this is a first century document. We have documents from the second century with more information but they're not in the Bible. And they shouldn't be. There's a reason they're not in the Bible. But here's the thing. If, unless we've got questions about it and go looking for it, because this business of the traveling teachers in the second century, this would become, this was a constant issue. Well, I always think about, well, sometimes think about it, that they didn't, you know, we say, well, what does the Bible say about that? They didn't have the complete Bible, you know. They didn't have a standard, so They're, they were all just trying to figure it out. That's right. I, I was just I was just in a conversation on a, a discussion group on Facebook, and and someone said, "Well, the problem with the church is that all these creedal Christians that um." all these credo Christians, that the Bible isn't about what you believe or say you think about God, like Jesus and fully human and fully man and the Trinity. The, the, the Christianity is about doing. And you have to say, okay, that's a good point. But where are all the non credal churches? You might think, well, what do you mean by a non credal church? Where are all the churches that say, you can believe Jesus is God or not, you can believe God as 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 without a trinity or with a trinity you can believe you can believe anything you want about god where are all those churches they're not there well why aren't they there they don't last. because they don't last 
because, well, so here you can see what happened. So John likes Demetrius, and John is telling Gaius, support Demetrius, and the Atrophies doesn't like him, and John's going to come down on him. Here's a question. How do you know which teacher is going to be helpful in the long term for the churches? Well, it's really hard. Well, well, we want the ones who do good. Okay. Can we get more specific on doing good? Because going visiting someone when they're sick or in the hospital or helping someone out with food or all of that is doing good. And you don't need to be a Christian to understand that that is doing good. But something has to track through time. And what? Even if you say, well, I'm not sure what should be, just look through time and ask yourselves, how have we been able to see communities that have grown and developed and, and actually endured and done well over long periods of time? It's been about what they believed. But you will know about those again. When they are eventually put forth, you will see they speak all tongues at once and are babbled. <laughs> okay. But it happened once to me back in the age. <laughs> babel. I mean, just utter babel words from, from I, my own family. I completely believe you, Louie. I completely believe you. But you got to consider I went hungry much, and so not to drop them dead. Okay. So, so here's, so, so very quickly what develops in the church is, the church has to figure out, and, and, and this is all new to them. How can we build a cohesive community of, now what's beneath all of this stuff? Trust. So little, so over last week, and how many of you know who, who Elon Musk is? That's exactly who I was thinking about. <laughs> okay, so who is Elon Musk? He's the one, He's the one who built Tesla. Yeah, you heard. So he was on the Joe Rogan show, and Joe Rogan, so now with all the stuff that I've been in the last year, I now know who Joe Rogan is. And So he was on Joe Rogan, and they're talking about this and that and this and that. And towards the end of it, Joe Rogan takes out this big cigar-like thing that's a mixture of tobacco and marijuana and lights it up and talks about it a little. And now this is legal in the state of California. So hands it over to to Elon Musk, and Elon Musk just, I mean, he barely touches the thing, but stock dropped 6%. <laughs> Why? He didn't do anything illegal. Yeah, but he lost <laughs> Ah, confidence. Trust. Trust. <laughs> that is what is beneath all of this. How do we create structures of trust? Well, it kind of come from they were questioning some of his decisions in the first place. So probably when they see him do that, they say, oh, there's what he's doing. Well, that's exactly right. Elon Musk has been, you know, Twitter seems to be the place that if you're feeling a little frisky and kind of want to cause some chaos, go out there on Twitter and tweet some stuff. There's someone who's really famous right now who's been doing that for a couple of years and the nation's been following his tweets. Well, I won't say who it is. <laughs> but Elon Musk over the last few months has kind of been doing the same thing. Then he shows up on, on the Joe Rogan podcast and Joe Rogan lights up, a, lights up a marijuana cigar and Elon just takes a little puff and bang, stop, drop 6%. You know, I kind of looked at it also. You know, he wanted to buy a lot of his stock back that was out there. That's and right. I kind of figured they had set this up so he looked kind of, and it dropped so he could buy, he could buy his stock back down much cheaper than he <laughs> And there's always the question. Elon, is, is Elon, is he, is he fraying? Or is he crazy like a fox? And here I took the fox part. Okay. <laughs> Barbara says, smart dude, he's thinking about buying back his stock. He's, you know, I'm gonna go on Joe Rogan and you know, I'm gonna just I'm gonna speak my mind and so he's there with a t-shirt and you know he's just talking about stuff and maybe he's thinking, I get this stock cheap enough, I'm gonna buy back my company and all these critics 
who have been saying the Tesla 3 isn't coming out, he's not meeting deadlines, he's never going to make it, I'm going to buy back the stock and I'm going to do it myself and could that be? Sure could. Or could it be that the pressure's getting to him and Just wasn't <laughs> things are fraying up there and he's taking it, that could be, we don't know, but trust. John trusts Demetrius. Diotrephes does not, whatever's going on with Diotrephes, John puts a motivation on him, whatever's going on here, and John is saying to Gaius, trust him. And oh, it's, well, how do we track trust? We track trust easiest through speech. <clears throat> Words and action. That's right. If I start saying stuff that, you guys have been listening to me for a long time, if I start saying things that you hear and you begin to say, is he okay? <laughs> but, but here's the thing, you'll sit there in that, this, this in-between space is pretty important because, well, let's think about Jesus. Jesus said a lot of things that made a lot of people pause. Because, well, here's another little, here, another little thing. Truth is stranger than fiction. And we all kind of know this. So Jesus tells the crowd, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you can have no part of me. And a whole bunch of people walk away. Well, well, well it's complicated because then at the meal he's going to say, this is my body broken for you. And his disciples, I mean, his disciples obviously have a high tolerance for not understanding stuff. Because he's clearly hard to understand. But here, and this is why when someone comes along and says, well, I think Jesus was just a good teacher. And I say, have you ever read the New Testament and not just read through a chapter and say, click, read this but slowed down and thought about it. You get to John 6 and you hear, you read him say, unless you eat my body and drink my blood and say, no, how do you understand that? Well now, if you've been in church a long time, it all gets contextualized, but when something's new, you don't know. But life is the kind of thing that you have to decide what am I going to do with these things? The disciples trusted him, so they stuck with him when he said crazy things, whereas people that might have only heard him once or twice gone. That's right. Yeah, I'm out of here. But they often went to Jesus and said, explain that to us. That's right. So they're living right there in that mix. So there's a, I got a great story from a guy who comes to the Jordan Peterson meetup things. He had a little boy who was in school, and in school the teacher was teaching them where waves and tides come from. They come from the moon. And, and so he thought, this guy's just a character. So he's, he says, says to his kid, well, let's go into the bathtub and do an experiment. So the kid got in the bathtub, and he took a flashlight over and said, am I moving the water? No. See that moon idea? What's with that idea that the moon has like rays and no. And then he took like a, a dinosaur toy and pumped it in the water, and he made waves. And so he told his kid, see, you want to know how waves get made? Godzilla over there in Japan stops in the water, and the waves come across the Atlantic. And, well, who did the kid believe? His dad. His dad. But then the kid went back to school, starts talking to his friends, and what do you think he says? And what do you think his friends start believing? Him. Because, well, it sure makes, he had the light above the tub. That didn't move the water. You know, the toy stopping in the water, that moved the water. So, of course, so finally the teacher contacts the dad and says, could you please talk to your son? Because my whole class is believing waves come from Godzilla stopping in the water by Japan. <laughs> Okay, 
course, he had a great time with this. The teacher was not amused. But here's, here's the kind of things that we are stuck with. So it's all about trust. And people trust John. Why? For a lot of reasons. Why? Well, he knew Jesus. Yeah. Been around a long time. It's been around a long time. This is why age offers status in many, many communities. And this is why Elon Musk takes a little pot and everyone says, how often does he do this? Is he doing this regularly? Was he, was he doing this when he tweeted out, I think I'll take my company private? Trust. I can call him sorry. So... This is, and this is, again, we're reading the letters of the early church. Verse 13. I have many things to write to you, but I do not want to write them to you by means of ink and pen. And we all say, shots! <laughs> Wish you had written more. We'd have more information. But I hope to see you right away and to speak face to face. And then verse, the last verse is, peace to you, friends, here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by your name, um, by my name. So, so how does he end the letter? What does he say? See you soon. We'll talk See more you soon. It. We'll talk more. We're reading his mail. But so happy that Gaius got the letter and, well, saved it. Someone came along and said, I hear you have a letter from John. Yeah, I do. Can I borrow it? No, you can't. Can I copy it? Sure, it's short. It'll just take a few minutes. So they copy it. And then the other guy, oh, did you? Gaius had that letter from John. Yeah, I made a copy. Can I read it? Yeah. Can I have your copy? No, but you can copy it. Copy <laughs> And on and on and on. And that's why we have it. And now we have this window into no big doctrine, but tells us a lot about what goes on even now. And right from the start. Those that seem to know are watching on those that don't know in our time and age. And that's the wrong thing to do, forcing on something. Okay. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this letter, and we thank you for your church and your community and how it has grown and what it has done. And we pray, Lord, that your spirit would continue to work and that your church would continue to grow. And Lord, we know it's a mess because we're a mess. And, and we don't know if Elon Musk is fraying at the edges or crazy like a fox because he's depressing stock prices in order to buy his company back. We don't know, Lord. But we ask, Lord, that you would be with us, that you would give us your spirit, and that you would do all that you promise. Hear our prayer now in the name of Jesus. Amen.